Good evening. Welcome to the Baker's CV Live coming at you from Houston Methodist Hospital. I am Dr. Stuart Carr, Director of Innovation for the DeBakey Heart and Vascular Centre. Tonight, we will be learning about the Houston Methodist Centre for Rapid Device Translation. And I'm pleased to have the Centre's Program Manager as my special guest this evening, Homer Quintana. The Centre for Rapid Device Translation, or CRDT for short, guides clients through safety studies and regulatory approval pathways to bring new medical devices to market. They provide full service expertise and study execution to achieve preclinical device validation and open the door for early phase clinical testing should it be required by a regulatory agency. We are delighted to also have on tonight's show Dr. Tim Boyer, CEO and co-founder of VenoStent, who are developing novel bioresorbable smart polymers to transform vascular surgery. Thus, we are here straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak, exactly how companies can become engaged and interact with the CRDT. Before we cut to our special guests, I would like to invite the audience into our discussions. Please submit your questions via web at pollev.com using debakey as the username or text debakey to 37607 alongside your question. So, without further ado, let's crack on. I'd like to again Say hello to my guest this evening, Homer Quintana. Homer, I'm sure the audience will love to know more about you and your center. Thank you, Dr. Kaur. It's a great opportunity to be here on this segment of Innovation on the Loose and really discuss what the Center for Rapid Device Translation does. Uh, I've got a short video that I'd love to share yes. that really visualizes all of the components and resources available through the center, please. Fantastic. Located in the heart of the Texas Medical Center, the largest medical complex in the world, the Center for Rapid Device Translation at Houston Methodist assists medical device companies as they drive their technology from idea to the clinic with safety, accuracy, and efficiency. We facilitate projects ranging from proof of concept to preclinical studies and clinical trials, and our centralized resources support the rapid development of medical device technology, all within one campus. The Comparative Medicine program features 65,000 square feet of space dedicated to large and small preclinical models with flexible housing configurations. The program offers good laboratory practice and non-good laboratory practice services for conducting risk, safety, and efficacy assessment studies in compliance with current FDA guidelines. Veterinary pathologist services and expertise for interpretation of preclinical study data are also available. With its newly installed Siemens 7 Tesla MRI, the Translational Imaging Core provides access to high-performance imaging for preclinical and clinical investigative studies, including magnetic resonance imaging and positron emission tomography. The core also features an on-site cyclotron creating radiopharmaceuticals for use in investigative studies and a preclinical and PET imaging clinic for multimodality imaging studies of preclinical models. The Preclinical Catheterization Core Laboratory offers a state-of-the-art environment to test novel vascular devices and techniques and provide training in the use of medical devices in preclinical or inanimate models. The lab manager has over 25 years of experience developing preclinical models designed to test all types of cardiovascular, perivascular, neurovascular, and endovascular devices and techniques. The Houston Methodist Institute for Technology, Innovation and Education, or MITEI, features 35,000 square feet of continuous space to quickly assess technology for proof of concept or early feasibility testing, as well as to train in the use of commercially available technology. MITEI consists of a virtual presence suite and networking connectivity throughout the Houston Methodist Hospital System, a skills lab equipped with 15 stations to conduct hands-on procedural training using various models, and private ORs, and a hybrid surgical suite containing an angio suite and MR capability within one room, allowing for real-time image-guided procedures. One of the largest facilities of its kind in the world, MITEI is a destination for emerging new technology and procedural techniques. The Center for Rapid Device Translation provides industry partners with access to leading experts from a broad range of Houston Methodist clinical specialties, many of which have earned top rankings from U.S. News & World Report. By working with key opinion leaders early in their projects, clients receive invaluable real-world input about their technologies. This can reveal issues from the professional perspective in the environments where the technology will be used. The facilities and expertise provided by the Center for Rapid Device Translation are here to guide and assist clients through their safety studies and regulatory approval pathways to bring new medical devices to market. 
We provide full service expertise and study execution to achieve preclinical device validation and open the door for early phase clinical testing via the Houston Methodist Academic Office of Clinical Trials. To learn more about the Center for Rapid Device Translation, please visit rapiddevicetranslation.org. That's fantastic. I feel I want to go out and go to Lowe's and build a device and bring over the center. So you'd like to tell us some more about it? Yeah, sure. So the center was established in 2017 under the vision of Ed Jones, the current CEO and president of the Houston Methodist Research Institute. And the goal has always been the same, to extend services to external clients in order to execute projects in medical device spaces uh, to move ideas from the clinic, uh, from the bench to the clinic with safety, accuracy, and efficiency. And really leveraging these resources, which you saw in the video, uh, to hopefully form collaborations and move the technology forward to the patient bedside as soon and as effectively as possible. And so I've got a couple of examples here uh, to share with you on technologies that have made it into the space. Uh, the first is Nerescue, which created a cardiac arrest device. Uh, they came to us and conducted a usability study and secured data that moved into a clinical trial. Uh, the next company, Laser Tissue Welding, conducted a GLP study, and based upon that data, they made it into human trials and are now in a phase two trial. And the third company that you're going to be hearing from today is Venostent, and uh, Dr. Boyer is going to be sharing more about that company. So, of course, here are the companies that we have worked with wow. this year. And, That's of course, it's slowed place. down a bit due to COVID. Uh, but at the same time, we're scaling back up, and we have plenty of projects to finish out the rest of the year and move into 2021. Uh, as you can see, we are not technology or um, medical space uh, specific. We are very agnostic as to the type of technology and projects that we take on. And, and the real goal is to find a key opinion leader or a clinical champion within the Houston Methodist space that's going to take that project on, whether it be a preclinical study or a clinical trial. Uh, or if the case is uh, for a feasibility study, then that's where the project takes form. There's a lot of really nice companies up there. Um, yeah, I'm going to pick a few out and maybe you can just give us a kind of overview. Sure. So Alleviant, um, tell us about those guys. Yeah, so Alleviant Medical has developed a device for heart failure and they've actually conducted several preclinical studies within Houston Methodist and are now looking at moving into a GLP study here at Houston Methodist within the next quarter or so. And so They're a homegrown company, right? The idea came out of Methodist. Of exactly, yes. And wow. they've been testing it here within the preclinical catheterization lab uh, with Daryl Schultz and his 25 years of experience in the space. And I saw a test card there, I believe. Are they a UK company? Yeah, so Test Card is a UK company that came to us from the TMCX cohort. Uh, they have a diagnostic-based system uh, that tests urine and can detect uh, certain conditions. So, for oh, instance, wow. uh, whether you've got chronic kidney failure, uh, they're looking at the pregnancy space as well. And so we're looking at collaborating with them on multiple projects. Uh, at this point, we're in the very early phases of establishing connections to key opinion leaders and driving those discussions into fruitful dialogue. Super, and I think I saw a Pathex there, and if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, are they based at Johnson Johnson Center for Device Innovation at the moment? They are, so Pathex is a sepsis detection and treatment technology. Super. And they are moving very quickly. They're working with us on a clinical trial around their detection uh, use of their device. And, and hopefully that will be executed within the next three to six months in collaboration with Dr. Wesley Long in our pathology department. Fantastic. The in the needle movement on that end would be fantastic. You know, sepsis is such a huge problem. And um, okay, so next slide. Fantastic. So as I mentioned, we have several investigators that are really champions in driving these, these projects forward. Without someone to be the steward and, and really drive the direction of these projects, uh, we don't really take them on. Uh, we don't function as your standard CRO in, in terms of just taking on uh, a project that comes to our door. The reality is we're looking for long-term collaborations and the ability to drive these projects into the clinic. So as you can see, we have clinical areas ranging from cancer in the cardiovascular space to COVID-19, uh, diagnostic imaging, gastroenterology, 
uh, and a few other spaces. And as I mentioned, we're agnostic as to the technology, but you have to have someone be excited about your technology here uh, in order for us to facilitate the project and drive it forward to whatever the next milestone is. And I see you've got a huge panel there of investigators and people that are part of the center. So what kind of areas and specialities do they represent? Yeah, sure. So we have uh, everyone ranging from uh, cardiovascular surgeons. Uh, in the case of Dr. Eric Peden, who participates with uh, VenoStent, he's the chair of uh, cardiovascular uh, surgery. And we've got other experts in their field. For instance, Dr. Tanya Herzog, the director of our comparative medicine program. She is working with uh, Pathex with regards to their sepsis treatment technology and brings with her uh, over a decade of experience in the sepsis space working with the NIH and building those models. So for a company like sepsis, they couldn't have come to, a, uh, like Pathex, they couldn't have come to a better space than Houston Methodist who has this tremendous wealth of knowledge and expertise in certain fields. I think the word dream team comes to mind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's, it's a passion and, and all of these individuals and several individuals that, that keep growing with regards to innovation uh, just have this tremendous passion for innovation. Fantastic. So of course, let's talk about the process and, and how it is that companies come to Houston Methodist and the Center for Rapid Device Translation and engage. Uh, initially, the company comes to me or a representative from a very specific department, say they reach out to a clinician, and we do our due diligence in vetting the company. Um, we generally hear about their desire to engage in a specific type of study uh, under general terms, of course, and we meet with them. Uh, of course, if, if both parties are interested, if, if the clinician's interested, if uh, other groups are interested, then we get a CDA in place, a confidentiality agreement, and we can go and actually start sharing protocols, whether it's uh, animal use protocols or clinical trial protocols. We can actually start sharing uh, data that's going to be relevant to then develop a budget uh, and get into alignment with regards to that budget so that we can draft an agreement. Now, once that agreement has been drafted and signed by both parties, then we have about 90 days. We've got a 90-day window, uh, as you can see, it, to actually go through the administrative components, such as the IRB submission, the IACUC submission and review, uh, credentialing of any staff that's going to be on site uh, by the sponsor, sponsor's designation so they can execute the study. And, and so the process takes about 90 days, and we've gotten it to an average about 78 to 80 days, which I think is a great metric, especially when you're trying to move things uh, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Uh, the term rapid comes to mind as, as, yeah. as in the name for the Center yeah, for Rapid Device Translation. Uh, and then of course we execute the study and, and hopefully uh, the results are beneficial to move the project onto its next milestone. Yeah, I think, now, you know, they're, they're saying 90 days there. I mean, you know, people in the audience might think, well, is that long, is that short? Um, you know, to do something of this quality, to get it done in 90 days, I think is fantastic. I mean, you know, like you're going through an IACUC, which is Institution for Animal Care and Use Committee, and you're getting everything in place. Again, this isn't just a standard CRO. This is like something that's elevating to a higher kind of level here. You know, right, so right. 90 and, days is great. And, and of course, the more preparation that the company has, uh, some of the things that they must have, obviously some kind of study protocol or design. We will help you with your study protocol and design, uh, but it's very difficult for us to start from scratch. And yeah. so if you show up with an idea or a design that we can work from, then that gives us a starting ground. And of course, discussion with experts concerning your regulatory pathway, um, that's not something that we work with. We, we like to keep that uh, outside of Houston Methodist. We'd like to execute your project and collaborate with you, but the regulatory components and the risks associated with it are determinant upon the company itself. Uh, and so you go out and you talk to your consultants for your regulatory pathway. You talk to a toxicologist for your study design. Uh, and then, of course, you have to have a desire to collaborate long term. We're not looking for projects that we can quickly execute and spin out. The goal is, as I mentioned initially, to move this technology into the clinic as quickly as possible so that our patients at Houston Methodist can benefit from it and our healthcare providers have another option to treat their patients. Uh, and of course you have to have some type of capital, um, whether it's outright uh, funding through the company, VC, or if the need arises a grant submission that's going to quickly get you that capital, we're willing to listen 
if the opportunity and obviously the key opinion leaders are there to champion you. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, it is all about the patience, and this is another prime example of eye care values in action. Excellent. Okay. Fantastic. So an example of our grant-funded collaboration is actually Vino Stent, and Tim is going to go into uh, a, a longer story and narrative as to how Vino Stent came to us. But in terms of just metrics and being able to execute projects, as you can see on this timeline here, we met the company in 2017, and by uh, the middle of 2019, he had secured enough data to go out and submit for a grant and was actually funded and subsequently funded again based upon further studies and is now in his first in vivo study in sheep here at Houston Methodist uh, as of January of this year. And so Tim can share that story. It's a great narrative. Um, I'm actually very proud of the technology and the drive that Venostent and the collaborative endeavors that Dr. Peden, uh, Dr. Karmonic, and, and Dr. Cook have undertaken, as well as the administrative staff at the uh, DeBakey Heart Center. They've done a tremendous job of stewarding and driving this project and ensuring that Houston Methodist provides their best foot forward. Excellent. So who is this mastermind, you may ask? So let's take it over to Tim. Tim, how are you doing, sir? Good, how are you? Good, thank um, you. And where are you? Where are you based? I'm at Team CX right wow. now, actually. Of course you are. That's <laughs> uh, what the action is. I'm here, I'm here most days. So um, we would love to hear more about Vino Stent. So maybe you, know, you can just give the audience you know, an overview of who you are, your background, and let, let us learn more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, should I share the deck? Yes, if you like to, sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, just brief, brief introduction on myself. Um, so I'm the Tim Boyard CEO of Vino Stent. Um, we are uh, developing an absorbable wrap for blood vessels, and uh, we're, we're looking to improve and save the lives of uh, millions of patients in need of vascular surgery every year, in, in particular focusing on hemodialysis patients, um, where this is truly their lifeblood. Um, and uh, this technology was actually developed over the course of my PhD at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, I came there from uh, a biotech company. Uh, I worked at Genzyme for three years before joining that lab, at, uh, Biomaterials and Tissue Engineering Lab in 2011. Uh, discovered a really interesting polymer, a new shape marine polymer in 2012 that had some unique properties to it. Uh, it was, it was uh, biodegradable, biocompatible. Bio it was um, mechanically compliant, um, similar to an artery, and uh, had some really unique thermal properties and shape memory properties. And so I set out to do to look for, um, you know, the right application for this technology. In 2014, I did this NSF I Corps program, uh, National Science Foundation I Corps program, basically customer discovery uh, for to help engineers and scientists solve real world problems. And it was through that process that I discovered the underlying uh, issues that hemodialysis patients experience. Um, I didn't know much about that problem, that clinical problem, until I started talking to physicians across the country. Uh, and we are steered towards developing this perivascular wrap, this wrap that goes around blood vessels, uh, or in particular the artery vein connections or, or vein graft connections of hemodialysis patients, uh, where it's very high failure rates. And, and so uh, fast forward, I, I finished my dissertation and um, my PhD in 2017 around this technology. And that's when uh, Jeff Lux, who is a Kennedy's MBA at Vanderbilt, uh, him and I met through a mutual mentor. We did the Health Wildcatters Accelerator Program in Dallas, Texas in 2017. And then it was actually at that time I was looking for, we we're looking for where to go next. And, just happened to get in touch with Tanya Herzog, uh, looking for a CRO in Texas. <laughs> and um, she introduced me to Homer. Homer introduced me to Dr. Keaton and several other, several other vascular surgeons that were interested in writing grants and whatnot. And so once we got a, just a tiny bit of funding in early 2018, we were able to move to Houston um, and you know really start up our, our lab work at, at J-Labs. Um, and also be collaborating with uh, uh, Professor Jordan Miller at Rice University, who 
specializes in 3D printing and vascularization models. And that, that collaboration along with Dr. Peden was um, really, has been really valuable for us to develop manufacture, a manufacturing process that's reliable and also to, you know, really um, test this in, in large animals. Um, a little bit of the backdrop of the, of the problem, basically one in eight people in the world suffer from this chronic kidney disease. And there are about over 700,000 patients in the U.S. that are, uh, have end-stage renal disease, um, about half a million relying on hemodialysis to sustain their life, to filter out toxins in their blood. Uh, the failure rate's uh, abysmal, it's 65% within a year. Um, healthcare costs for this problem are 34 billion um, to treat hemodialysis patients, about 3 billion for this particular problem of these access site failures. And it costs Medicare uh, and taxpayer about $20,000, dollars every time these surgeries fail. So uh, there's nothing that's done as a pre preventative means currently. And so we're, we're hoping we, we can really change this. Uh, we did win uh, prestigious, some prestigious awards. Um, we won the Kidney X Prize, uh, one of six projects recognized nationally. Um, in July of this year, uh, as a half million dollar uh, cash prize. Uh, we also have, since I met Homer, we got an NI NSF Phase One grant where we did some work at Houston Methodist. Um, and then in 2019, just last year, we got an NSF Phase Two grant uh, and we were able to get an NIH Phase One grant this year as well. Uh, and that, that project is ongoing. Um, the, yeah. Just described the problem, um, why these vessels fail, uh, really due to this inward growth process uh, called neutomal hyperplasia. And um, the, the great part about our technology is that we promote this outward growth of the, of the vessels, and we also provide this mechanical support. And it's a combination of these two things that we see as beneficial. Uh, the real special sauce here is our material that I developed at Vanderbilt, and we have you know, filed additional IP since, since then, um, altered our formulations to really make it optimal for this ap application. We have tunable thermal mechanical degradation properties uh, tailored specifically for this application um, to enable it to conform to a patient's geometry. So it is slightly sticky and adhesive at body temperature to enable this custom fit to each patient, uh, which we think is critical. Um, the yeah, you can just sort of see how it is applied um, in this video. Um, sort of fast forward where uh, this is done. You know, the surgery done in the arm where you have an artery vein connection, it just slides up there, uh, as you can see in that video, and then you just slide it down over the anastomosis. Um, this was a, actually a non-survival pig experiment uh, in December 2018. Uh, showing how we can implant our device, uh, just really sliding it down once that artery vein connection is made and um, fits snugly over that artery vein connection, the fistula. Um, we did uh, an experiment in January of 20, uh, this year actually, um, with Dr. Peden. Uh, it was really helpful in identifying some of our design changes we needed to make, to make our materials more flexible, and um, to be able to fit it around that anastomosis area. Uh, the, we, we, were, we were also able to secure you know, some funding to do uh, a, a sheep a survival study out to three months uh, at American Preclinical Services in, um, in Minneapolis, which is part of this NSF Phase II grant where we have a sub-award with, with Houston Methodist. And um, you know, the, the feedback on uh, Dr. On our design from Dr. Peden has been extremely helpful as we gear up for a GLP sheep study, but this study showed a proof of concept that we saw significant reductions in neonatal microplasia, uh, the main culprit of these failures, as well as a significant expansion of the lumen um, around the vein and anastomosis regions based on the histology. Um, and so this, this told us that our device and our technology is actually working, and um, that's why we're basically completing all our biocompatibility testing we need now to um, do a first in human trial and, and do our GLP study um, somewhat in parallel, uh, probably pushed out more to January of this year, or of next year. Um, 
and we've been able to grow our team with the funding. We anticipate doing a U.S. Pitbull study, and hopefully, Houston Methodist. You know, we plan to, definitely plan to have them as a as one of the sites there um, in 2022. Um, and we're raising capital right now. We actually have uh, a term sheet uh, we just recently received to uh, secure this funding, uh, and uh, looks like we're in good financial shape, and we can. Um, We've been able to grow our team. We can continue to grow our team further. Um, have a fantastic team of, of, that I'm blessed to lead, um, biomedical and mechanical engineers, um, as well as uh, Jeff, our, our COO. Uh, and we have fantastic advisors along the way that help us along the way uh, in, in cardiology, nephrology, vascular surgery, as well as industry leaders, such as uh, former executives at, uh, at BD Bard, uh, or other startups that have exited their companies. Um, so that's a just a quick overview, and and don't want to take up uh, too much more time. So, uh, opening the floor to any questions. Tim, that was fantastic. Thank you very much for that. And you know, we're actually getting a couple of questions coming in from the audience, so we'll just save that for a few minutes. Uh, I'm curious, you know, when you're doing your PhD. Um, it sounds like you didn't set out to discover and make a polymer for this application. Like, what, what was it that you were actually um, looking to do within the time you were doing your PhD? Like, what was the, the reason you were doing it, I guess? Yeah, so I, when I first came to Vanderbilt, I was actually assigned to a project. It was an NSF Career Award project where they were looking to make a different type of shape memory polymer. And we were actually trying to make a different chemistry work. Um, to be able to attach growth factors and, and all these sorts of different things. And I realized that the polymer that we had make, made it as an intermediate step uh, had, some, had the ability to cross-link under UV light um, due to its chemistry and could be a novel shape memory polymer. Was, and so we, we, I, I you know, said, you know, let's... Let's uh, characterize this polymer and, and, and end up having some very uh, interesting properties to it that were very amenable for vascular applications. And so then I started cl collaborating with a vascular surgeon at Vanderbilt and looking at the different vascular applications of the technology. And that's when uh, I was able to, I was sort of having an eye towards maybe, you know, using this, this material for, for some kind of medical application. That was, you know, the real goal. And, did the National Science Foundation i -Corps program in 2014 that helped gear us uh, shift, shift our focus and my focus to uh, developing this perivascular wrap for hemodialysis patients because it was such an unmet clinical need. Uh, it was a shorter path to um, market compared to <clears throat> developing a wrap for like, heart bypass surgeries. And, you know, it was just, it was, there, there's a lot of passion around the problem. The passion uh, from affected loved ones and even from surgeons was, was palpable and contagious. So um, something I knew that I wanted to do at that point. You know, I'm glad you, I'm, well, I'm very glad you took part in the NSF i -Corps program. I mean, it's a very good program for startups and people that have new technology to go through. And I know part of it is you go in with a hypothesis of what you think your device could be used for, and then you go out and do a, discuss, a customer discovery program, right? Where you interview maybe a hundred people and right. then you get feedback and you work out if your hypothesis was true or not. So what was your hypothesis going in to that program? Yeah, so at that point in time, we had looked at per perivascular wrapping and we're thinking specifically about a wrap for coronary bypass wrapping uh, because the vascular surgeon we were working with really specialized in, in trying to develop uh, therapies and uh, yeah, really therapies for, for that indication and, you know, I was getting feedback from cardiologists and some cardiovascular surgeons at the time that said, you know, this is a, I mean, kind of a moonshot sort of thing where you have, you, know, you have to conduct five, you know, five year cl long clinical trials and maybe that'll be hmm. positive, you know, um, whereas, uh, you know, one of the vascular surgeons I spoke with said, why don't you look at hemodialysis axis? And, at that time, I wasn't familiar at all with that clinical problem, and he explained how the failure rates are just so much higher, and looking into it, it just made so much sense. It's the same issues that occur there with this neonatal microplasia uh, with these vein grafts, but it's, uh, you know, it, you see a 60% failure rate within a year, so 
to show an, you know, an actual impact of, on, the, on the patients uh, would be make, take far less fewer you know, resources and would allow us to um, you know, not only get to market quicker, but also treat patients that are really in need of a better solution because their lives may very well depend on the um, usability and durability of their access site. That's fantastic. And I guess I'd love to know what is next on the agenda for Vino Stent? Like, well, like, what's the next goals that you need to do, you know, with CRDT? And when is this going to get into the clinic, do you think? Yeah, uh, the, um, yeah, so in terms of when we're going to get on, um, yeah, so, so we're doing our, our GLP sheep study now. Or sorry, we're, we're, we're preparing for a GLP sheep study now. We're, we're completing our biocompatibility testing currently. Uh, and um, we're basically writing the protocols now for our first in human trial. Uh, I know that we, had, we, were, we still have some ongoing grant work at Houston Methodist. Uh, on the NSF side, we're doing planning more experiments to try to make some minor tweaks to our design based on uh, the basically the computational fluid dynamics um, and the biomechanical hemodynamic impacts that we're seeing. Uh, we have some preliminary data that suggests you know we, we're on we're on the right track with our with our designs, but you know there's sort of like research and then there's development going on simultaneously. But basically, we will uh, be doing our first in human clinical trials next year, and that'll allow us to get to a point of submitting an investigational device exemption most likely early 2022, um, so that we can um, do a U.S. Pittle study in 2022. Wow. And then, and then the, to get to market would be probably another uh, two years. So we're looking at 2024, most likely for a U.S. market. So you're literally in the thick of it at the moment. In the thick of it, yeah. It's an interesting <laughs> phase right now. Where it's like we've, we've established some real proof of concept, and now we're shifting to actual actually test you know validating that in in humans as well as uh, further large animal implantations that's great that's really good work there tim um so let's go to the audience question and answers and i'm seeing one uh, from michael i think this is for you tim uh, is houston better than dallas for startups i would say it yes is. but <laughs> yes it is <laughs> uh point blank um, yeah, I mean, Houston does have more to offer. I mean, I would argue it's a better culture here, um, but it's, there's, there is a culture for innovation here. I think that the physicians in this town just have a general um, keen interest in new technologies, and um, not to say that's not enti entirely not true in Dallas, but there's just more of a culture of that here. Uh, I would say that the, you know, Texas Medical Center has, has, has you know, bred that culture over the years. Uh, and for us, it was, you know, the, the access to uh, clinicians like Dr. Peden and, and um, as well as to, um, you know, professors of bioengineering as well as J labs and, and, you know, having some solid wet lab space here. Um, and we definitely find Houston to be our home. I think it's, it's phenomenal if you look at what's happened here at TMC over the last four or five years, right? It's just it's just growing and growing. We've got TMC three coming out now. It's, I mean, it literally is just it's mind boggling to be honest. The speed at which it's going, and you know, as a reason we're called the third coast now. You know, uh, third coast mobile device technologies and medtech. Um, I think we've got another question there. I think this is for Homer. So, what's the best project to come out of the CRDT? Or well, maybe the most memorable, I guess. Okay, know? perhaps the most memorable. Uh, I honestly think that all the projects have tremendous value in that they're trying to find solutions for unmet clinical needs or clinical needs that need a better solution. And, and so when I look at Tim and Venostent, I have a personal connection to Venostent because I've lost a friend's, uh, her mother passed away because she did not want to go through the AV fistula creation process after her first one ruptured. And she completely gave up on the concept of dialysis. Uh, unfortunately, she passed away, and so that, to me, drives the necessity for technologies like this to make it into the clinic as quickly and as effectively as possible. So I, I'm a big champion of, of Tim and Venostent. Uh, I'm a big champion of other technologies that are out there trying to facilitate 
the healthcare provider continuum and, and the paradigm that exists uh, for our patients. Um, I, I can't really choose one. I, I'm a big fan of Venostents. Uh, I've also got other projects that are in early feasibility that I'm very excited for. Mm -hmm. As someone that understands that there are a thousand ways to die in biotech and life sciences, uh, my goal through the Center for Rapid Device Translation and all of the cores that are available is to de-risk that technology along the way and hopefully make it into the clinic uh, as quickly as possible. I think, you know, what you've done yourself, Homer, over the last kind of three years is, is phenomenal. I mean, like, I'm looking at those companies there, uh, and these are all legit, amazing companies, you know, and it's, it's, it's just, it really is fantastic, the work that's been done over the last three years. Um, so, so what's next for the CRDT, you know, like, how, how are you growing, like, you know, what's the next big kind of step for you guys? Yeah, sure. So now we're housed out of uh, MITEI, the Methodist Institute for Technology, Innovation and Education. And the goal really is to move into more GLP studies that are going to ideally move technologies into the clinic uh, for clinical trials or right into uh, the clinic as, as a standalone product. Um, and, and we're looking at that and, and facilitating the capacity to execute GLP studies within Houston Methodist. It's something that, that I'm a big champion of, although I, I do enjoy seeing companies walk through feasibility projects. The reality is until you get data that's going to be reviewed by a regulatory body for a decision that's going to send you into humans, uh, it, it's still a long ways to go. And so Tim is seeing it firsthand as he's executing these GLP studies, uh, the necessity and, and really uh, the dire impact of everything that he's doing in those GLP studies because that data will be reviewed by a regulatory body, in his case the FDA, uh, to allow him to actually move his technology into a human being and, and see what happens uh, on, under obviously a pilot project, uh, early phase one study. Um, so, so to me, GLP is the big vision behind what the Center for Rapid Device Translation is trying to pursue and obviously augmenting the capabilities of the ecosystem that exists within Houston. Uh, you know, we're a very innovative group. It's the largest medical complex in the world and there should be more technologies and companies coming out of this space. That's great, Homer. Um, I just saw a really interesting thing in the monitor there. I don't know if anyone else saw it there. It just went all a little bit jiggly. <laughs> so the VPT guys are saying move on. Um, so I would like to take this opportunity to close out this evening. Um, and just thank my special guests Homer and Tim. You know, it's been an honor having you on the show. And I wish you all the all the best, all the best luck in the world. Thank you so Moving much. Moving forward. Um, and I believe we have a video we want to end up. And I'd just like to, again, so um, we have an event on December the 7th. It's called Pumps and Pipes. Um, bringing together world leaders in aerospace, energy, and medicine. And this is an online virtual uh, event and you really need to sign up to this. This will be fantastic it's for everyone, startups, technologists, investigators. Let's learn about how Houston is translating itself to be the transitioning energy capital of the world. Let's look at what NASA are doing with Blue Origin and SpaceX, etc. And let's look at all the exciting things that are happening here in the TMC. So again, thank you and goodbye. In the early 20th century, when two giants from distinctively separate disciplines collaborated on the development of an extracorporeal circulation device, I doubt they realized how extraordinarily unique their partnership was. At this moment, we are positioned in a fast-paced world where technology is advancing and globalization increasing, where distances get shorter, competition increases, and expectations are more demanding. A time when we need to make the best use of knowledge and look at each challenge from different points of view. A time for transdisciplinary integration of the sciences. A time when convergence innovation is needed most. Innovative leaders are curiously optimistic as they dare to take risks. And when leaders work together, the capacity to innovate increases exponentially.
world's most complex problems require convergence innovation. Through this approach, we have the ability to live longer, foster a better quality of life, and preserve this tiny rock we call Earth. It's why we are here, for the benefit of all.